Welcome to Slime House, a podcast rated PG for crude humor, outrageous hijinks, and mild language. Today, we're going to be talking about 2005's The Adventures of Shark Boy and Lava Girl in 3D. I'm Jared. I'm Jasper. I'm Max. I'm Nelson. And I'm Sam. Thanks for joining us, Sam. How are you doing today? I'm, I'm good. I have a lot of things to say about this movie. I had not seen it, so I'm excited to talk about it. Well, it's good to have you back for this one. You were on our first episode, for those listeners who don't know, on our episode about Flubber. I'm sorry that everyone else was such a disappointment by comparison, but I'm back, so we can finally have another good one. <laughs> I'd say more than a guest, you're like the recurring cast members who, you know, come in for a couple episodes. The cousin yeah. who comes into town for the holiday episodes. Yeah, I'm yes. like John Turturro in the show Monk, where I show up like once a season <laughs> as the brother. <laughs> Exactly. Like Minecraft Holmes. <laughs> yeah. Diving in, The Adventures of Shark Boy and Lava Girl in 3D is a story of a misfit fourth grader named Max who conquers the problems he has at home and at school with a pair of superheroes that he has conjured up in his dreams named Shark Boy and Lava Girl. And together they go to the planet Drool to defeat the darkness that is overtaking the planet, which parallels Max's troubles in life. There's no such thing as Shark Boy and Lava Girl. No one believed Max's stories. This is the real world. Now, it's with the help of Shark Boy and Lava Girl, he'll show the world. We can't control it. What do we do? Scream. The true power of dreams. And most dreams don't come true on their own. You have to make them true. From the director of Spy Kids. Kids need their dreams. I don't believe it. The Adventures of Shark Boy and Lava Girl in 3D. Ready PG. In theaters Friday, June 10th. The Adventures of Shark Boy and Lava Girl was directed, written, shot, edited, and scored by Robert Rodriguez, who has long been known as sort of a one man film crew. He's written a lot of books about how to make movies cheaply and stuff like that, so it only makes sense that he would have done all these different roles on the film. But one of the most interesting things about this movie, especially in regards to Slime House, is that the story is by Racer Rodriguez, who is Robert Rodriguez's son, who was eight years old at the time. And I think that we always talk about how Slimehouse is sort of wish fulfillment for a like sort of eight-year-old boy mentality. And I think it's interesting to see that come to life in this movie, where <laughs> the story is actually an eight-year-old boy's idea. And I mean, it does feel like an eight-year-old's idea. And I mean that in the best way. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the cast of this movie, you have two Taylors in the lead, Taylor Lautner and Taylor Dooley are the titular Shark Boy and Lava Girl, Taylor Lautner, who of course went on to star as Jacob Black in the Twilight franchise. The lead, Max, is played by Caden Boyd. His parents are played by David Arquette and Kristen Davis, who might be at the time probably the biggest stars in this movie. And George Lopez plays the villainous Mr. Electric, who, and also several other characters in the movie, such as Mr. Electric's real-world equivalent, the teacher, Mr. Electrucky Dodd, and Tobor, <laughs> a robot that was invented to do homework. Excellent. So what's everyone's experience with this movie before today? Had you seen it? Had you not? Had you heard of it? I had heard of it. I missed it when it was in theaters. It just looked like off-brand spy kids to me when i was 13 so uh, i didn't see it until yesterday yeah i uh you know i didn't see it either i think i was a little too old for it but i do remember seeing it constantly advertised at old navy i remember just like <laughs> old navy diving into shock boy and lava girl so hard and me seeing it and being like oh that movie it's it's everywhere but i never actually saw it until I guess two days ago, which was kind of wild. It didn't seem like that long ago that it came out, and then you watch it, and you're like, that was a long time ago. Old Navy and Shark Boy and Love Girl is one of the more interesting marketing partnerships I've ever heard of, probably. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I think, though, like, they, I associate those with a very similar time in my life, so it doesn't seem that weird to me. I'm like, you know, yeah, Old Navy being in, you know, late elementary school and buying some cheap jeans because I was going to grow out of them very quickly. Shark Point Lava Girl, which I had already grown out of. <laughs> <laughs> I actually never saw this until now as well. And I had really no interest in seeing it at the time. I was a big fan of the original Spy Kids, um, directed by Rodriguez as well. But after Spy Kids 3D, you know, I was kind of done with Rodriguez's kids stuff. 
So I, I kind of wrote this off, especially because of the 3D element. However, a few years later, I me and some buddies kind of rented his movie Shorts as a joke at Blockbuster on a Friday night. And it was very kooky, bad fun. Like it it's it's super silly, but it knows that it's super silly. So that kind of reinvigorated an interest in this movie for a very long time. And again, I hadn't seen it until now, but low key, I had a blast watching this and we'll get into that a little later, but pleasant surprise. Four of the five of us had a similar experience of feeling too old for this movie and something that about Spike, it's 3D that left a sour taste in my mouth enough to kind of step away that I think this movie benefits from not being a 13 year old, but from being in your 20s and viewing it in those lenses. As I've mentioned quite a few times, I feel like on this podcast when we talk about this, I'm, I think, probably three or four years younger than all of you all. So I was maybe, I was nine or ten when this came out. And I remember being pretty excited for it. I liked the Spy Kids movies. And at this time, I don't remember whether I liked their Spy Kids 3D or not, or whether I even, that played any part in my childhood. But 3D still was enough of, like, an exciting gimmick because it was something you could only really get out of, like, a a Disney world, like a Disney attraction or something. You didn't really see 3d in theaters. So it felt very special that this was like a movie where the whole shtick was that it was in 3d. So I remember seeing these trailers and I remember my dad was a Rodriguez fan of his, like of like El Mariachi and from dusk till dawn. So he was kind of hyping it up too. So I definitely went to go see this with my dad, probably opening weekend. The movie itself plays very little part. I don't remember whether I liked it. I didn't really have any merch other than Happy Meal toys, which weren't something I went out of my way to get. But I did see the movie, and I remembered watching it again, especially a lot of the 3D gags, which I'm sure we'll get into later. I remember like experiencing a lot of those in the theater. Uh, I was going to say, this is the first movie that I can think of where they deliberately have a p- part of the movie where the characters put on their 3D glasses, so yeah. encouraging you to put on <laughs> your 3D glasses. Uh-huh. Yeah, and, and so something else, th- those glasses that they put on in the movie, that like the ones you got in the theater were the like were designed to look like those, which I thought was neat. Like they gave out both Lava Girl and Shark Boy glasses, and then <laughs> Mc- McDonald's also had an exclusive pair of glasses. I don't remember what they looked like that you could only get from Happy Meals. So yeah, I thought that was actually super cool that they like put the 3d glasses into the universe of the movie that's interesting uh i actually didn't put that together when we were watching it all i saw was some pretty rad shark (laughs) sunglasses yeah (laughs) and i think additionally only the scenes on planet drool were in 3d so the movie was not in 3d up until that point when they put on their glasses interesting just like wizard of oz guys (laughs) <laughs> it's there's some wizard Honestly, of oz vibes yeah. here the tornado <laughs> just saying. i actually yeah on that note just if you want to jump in i actually see a lot of wizard of oz in this another movie or book actually that this reminds me of and i just recently watched the movie is the phantom toll booth um mm-hmm. which is a similar kind of kid friendly adventure that uses um kind of very kind of higher level thinking as a way to construct a interesting fantasy land there's also kind of ties into movies like Inside Out as well. Maybe a bit more of a stretch, but at the same time, I think that I didn't realize that this movie went kind of as deep on the philosophical or kind of cerebral elements as it does. And I was, I kind of really dug it, to be honest. Yeah, that was something that I didn't remember at all. So it was cool watching this movie for the first time as an adult. And not that it's like, super profound or anything but to realize that it did have like some deeper themes it was tackling that i didn't remember from my childhood i don't want to put this on too high of a pedestal (laughs) let's dive in let's talk about what's where does this fit in the slime house timeline i think what we might say is that it's in the swamp era after 2004 it wasn't a big hit at the box office and got poor reviews it also came out a few months after another movie Rodriguez made called Sin City, which was a very controversial movie. Rodriguez is, I think, really worth getting into a lot. We have a lot of his movies that eventually will be covered in Slimehouse. He is... I met him. Oh, oh wow. Yeah, so this was August 2016. There's a theater in Austin called The Paramount. 
and they were showing the classic Hitchcock movie, Strangers on a Train, and my sister wanted to go. She lived there at the time. And I saw a guy in the hat that Rodriguez is known for, you know, one of his Rodriguez's many signature hats. So I, I asked him if he was Robert Rodriguez, and he said no. And I was basically <laughs> in line. I was in a line next to him to get concessions. And so he's just like parallel to me, and I asked him, and he said no. And then I was like, oh, okay. And like he's still in line next to me for ten seconds, and he, he's just like, okay, actually, I am Robert Rodriguez. <laughs> <laughs> so th- that was great. What a guy. His kids' movies are interesting, and I actually, um, I, I don't want to say this isn't Slimehouse, but I do think there's a distinction with the kids' movies he makes in that there's like an earnestness to them, and I really feel it in this, where it's like there's no cynicism. Like he, he's making a movie to encourage his, his kids to be creative, you know? And like, that, that's like a very different, I guess just a different thing. There's, there's like a, you know, I'm, I'm amazed that they spent as much money as they did on a movie written by his child. But, but yeah, like I, I, I kind of, I'm fascinated by like, it did kind of feel like he made the adult movies that he wanted to make. You know, I've heard he does similar things with like his movies for adults where, you know, his cast and crew, um, you know, he encourages them to be really creative and it's a lot of like painting on set making food you know every, everything's kind of like channeling your inner creativity and i i feel that with his other with with all of his movies but he definitely uh kind of imbues that into his kids movies and this one i feel really strongly and maybe it's a little on the nose there's an awful lot of telling people to dream and dream harder but yeah like there's it, there's like an earnestness to it i guess is what i'm what i'm getting at i was just gonna echo that i i totally agree with that sam I was a bit of a cynic about Rodriguez's kids' movies. I do love the original Spy Kids, but, you know, kind of after watching shorts and the, you know, subsequent Spy Kids movies, I was like, eh. But he just kind of does them for his kids and wrote them off. But there is that, like, maybe I'm just kind of a sucker for these kind of movies, but these movies that promote letting kids' imaginations run wild and visually depicting that as some kind of magical adventure. And I, and that's maybe why I kind of really dug this movie and why it's really emblematic of a lot of Slimehouse ideals is because it's teaching kids to have agency over their own thoughts and that you have the power to you know follow your dreams or defeat evil however you see it. And to me, that, you know, is... is kids ruling over you know their own kind of the way they see society i think is really the the key the heart of slime house i feel like what makes rodriguez super key to slime house to me even if his movies may not exactly fit in the slime house mold the way some other things we've talked about is slime house and i mean kids and family movies in general are really seem to be sort of lacking like a tourist figures in that, like, I don't think there's really any director who working in, like, the slime wheelhouse at all who you can see a movie and know it's theirs. There's people who have made a lot of slime house movies, such as maybe Raja Gosnell, even Chris Columbus, but I don't think you can see a... and be like, this is a Gosnell. But, like... <laughs> <laughs> Except for Kenny Ortega. Kenny oh, that's true. Ortega's an, uh, uh, a slime on tier, too. But, yeah, I feel like Rodriguez is just really the only director in the slime house world who has works with a lot of the same actors, same look to all his kids' movies, same themes to his kids' movies. It's like, whenever, well, he makes adult movies too, of course, but when he makes kids' movies, his movies are very distinct, even maybe more so than the similarities between his movies for adults. Yes, I think that's all 100% in that, I think because he makes a lot of very specific types of genres of movies i do feel like he is a slime house auteur because when he's making a kid's movie he's making a kid's movie god damn it you know like there is no if ands or buts about it and i'm watching this and normally when i watch slime house for the podcast i'm kind of taking notes of the tropes and what's familiar and all that but in this one it's so much bigger than that because i feel like He's like a Fellini or a Bergman <laughs> of Slimehouse where he's really going for his own whatever and it's it's sort of the highest regard for Slimehouse that we have seen for that exact reason that Max is describing that he's someone who's out to make this kind of movie. So it doesn't have as many of the tropes or maybe details, but the vibe is wholly unique. Yeah, I think something else kind of important to look at is we've talked about Slimehouse Grindhouse sort of as a 
uh, it's based on that. And I mean, if anybody of any current modern director really has one foot in the like grindhouse ethos, it's Robert Rodriguez. I mean, he did part of the movie grindhouse even. So he definitely has a deep awareness and fondness for that kind of thing. And also just a fondness for trying to make movies as cheaply and quickly (laughs) as possible. (laughs) It's true. Last thing I would add is that, you know, when it started, I was kind of like, Oh yeah, you know, his kid, this, this like little kind of like opening narrated bit feels like it was written by an eight year old. Um, you know, like I wonder if he used, I wonder if like his son wrote that. And then I wonder if he like used his kids drawings as a jumping off point, but I wonder what kind of movie we're going to get into. And I think the, the, uh, where we end up is like the closest thing I can think of to like actually just seeing a movie written by an eight year old. Like it really does feel like it's the mind of a kid. And I actually read about it cause I wanted to know like how much input his kid actually had. And the answer is apparently a lot. Like apparently he would write the script and then run like jokes by his son who would be like, nah, you know what? I would say it like this. And he was like, so it wasn't just like, uh, it wasn't just like, oh yeah, he was inspired by his kids. Like this kid had, it like really does feel like an eight year old's like dream journal. And, you know, and, and some people can say for worse, but, but you know, there, I don't know. It's, it's kind of, it stands alone. I haven't felt that before. Even spy kids, which is very creative and encouraging of creativity and really feels like it was made for his kids still has like an adult, like kind of like clever sensibility Mm -hmm. yeah or even logic to it i think you're that's true of like yeah the moment you see like sharks just moving their mouth talking with adult voices you're like okay we're in we're in someone else's brain and that someone is eight (laughs) it actually to me kind of felt like how a dream would move like there there's a narrative and I obviously we all dream different. So I'd be curious to hear your guys takes, but there's this, there's kind of a through line and there's, there's an obvious narrative, but the way in which they get places is just so kind of haphazard, but in a way that you buy it in this movie, because it's this dream world, because it's this kid's creation. And in that way, to me, it's much more interesting in a way it's less predictable it's much it keeps you on your toes and you know it it kind of sells the whole thing you know that it actually does feel like a dream in your dreams do you have shark boy and lava girl no but i do have banana split boats that i take down the to the down the river and 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 george lopez as a giant robot chasing me around. <laughs> yeah you know did you guys know that apparently they when they filmed his face for all the robot scenes they like put the camera like three inches from his face and like <laughs> gave him pieces of tape that he had to like where his eye lines for all the characters you know like because they like for all the scenes and like apparently they kept having to redo them because he was like looking at the wrong part of the tape like he it was so close to his face that his eyeline would be off if he looked at like the inside edge as opposed to the middle <laughs> As Mr. Electric, his eyes are just going to look like they're all over the place anyway, though. It's like he's always looking like to the sides of things. Yeah, and he's like, bugging out. out. Yeah, he was bugging out, man. <laughs> yeah, that's a perfect example where it's not a Slimehouse trope, but what a Slimehouse character he is. It's like yeah. a guy whose head is so big. And yeah, I, I was wondering, like, how the hell did they distort it so much? And he, you know, <laughs> flexes his electricity muscles and just gets to be a ham fisted dream villain yeah actually really quick nelson i really like what you're saying kind of there's not a lot of tropes necessarily in this movie but this is the movie out of all the ones we've watched so far that i took the most notes on just because there's so much that is of the slime house attitude in this movie yes but not necessarily of kind of the construction of a slime house movie which i actually really loved it felt very fresh in that regard from a lot of the movies we've watched I liked it too. It's kind of thin. Like, like I, I think that's like maybe my, my, like before we just all love on the adventures of shark boy and love. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to like the thing I like, it's like, I kind of like liked it in, in spite of it a little bit where it was like the, the fact that it's so earnest and does all these things that are so cool and like really does explore the mind of a child in a way that we don't normally see. I'm like more willing to forgive the fact that like for most of the movie, like it's kind of one note, on like a story level, um, you know, it's like, it's kind of just like, Hey, we got to get another situation. Dream, dream it, dream away. I think that that's, that's why it wasn't received well, but also, you know, everyone who, who would have that comment isn't an eight year old kid. So, so I, I think it's interesting, but yeah, I just, I, I can't let us all just, 
just love on this movie unconditionally. Like let's let's <laughs> ground it a little bit. No, I'm in I'm film glad criticism. because I I also found the movie to be a little bit two dimensional. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I feel like I, I, all the stuff in like the on planet drool I thought was like cool and like very unique and very earnest as we've said. But then whenever it would go back to the Earth storyline, especially. I mean, we'll be getting into character tropes soon, so I'm sure we'll talk about them. The kids' parents are in a failing marriage, but you really don't see any of that or really understand anything about their disintegrating relationship. It's very, like, in the... And then at the very end, there's, like, a super emotional scene where they're getting sucked into tornadoes, and they're like, "I I I thought you wanted me to leave, and he's like, no, never, and it's just... I feel like that. That's like the, the the actual plot in the real world of this movie is very thin. But I do, I still do very much like the movie and appreciate its existence. And with that, let's jump into some character tropes because I feel like this is the these character tropes are the the one slimehouse trope that really really come to life in this a lot. Max just mentioned the parents kind of who are struggling to stay married. Marital difficulties pop up in these movies. The other big adult in this movie is the teacher. I think the dual casting of George Lopez as the teacher and then also as the villain is, uh, I think that's further impounding on something we have talked about, which is the teachers are these misguided authority figures that are, are misunderstood and they're villainized by the kids. And this isn't the first Robert Rodriguez movie I've seen that does this. It's actually another movie of his that is not one of the kids' movies, The Faculty. When we interviewed Christopher McDonald, he brought up that movie because he was in it. But that also has this trope of like, these teachers are the man and they're not to be trusted under any circumstances. And yeah, I just really like George Lopez in this movie. So, <laughs> uh, Especially the uh, when he starts talking in terms of like actual scientific units, like Watts up. <laughs> and and that, that slayed me. That was great. And not only that he says them, but then he has to, like, a mansplain them to the children. <laughs> Get ready for the mega hurts! Get it? As in the unit of electrical frequency? Wow, you just start paying attention in class, are you? Yeah, and his character, his last line in the movie, to me, speaks a lot to the Slimehouse ethos. He says, almost verbatim, a great teacher learns as much from his students as they learn from him which I think speaks to that large umbrella Slimehouse themes of kids teaching adults lessons and adults learning valuable things from children, which I think is, you know, very apparent in this movie. Now that said, it, I, <laughs> <laughs> it's my role now is just be the negative one, even though I like hey, the movie. Hey, we, we need that. You see the first 25 minutes and you're like, okay, these adults, who's going to be kind of like, who's the, who's the antagonist? Who's the force that when we go to Oz, he's going to ultimately be fighting against, right? And it's like, it was really hard to figure out what George Lopez, the teacher, like exactly how he was the problem. He was kind of a weird, like, villain in a bizarre amalgam of ways. And then meanwhile, there was that scene where Max's mom just straight up says, stop dreaming so much and just be a real, you know, be a normal kid. And so it's like, well, see, so she's kind of going to be the villain. Like, you know, it was, it's just it's one of those weird things where I had a hard time just like organizing who was I, I guess the answer is that they're all the adults are just kind of are just kind of bad, you know, need to learn something from a kid. But it was it was a little messy. It's definitely messy. And it's definitely this kid angst of why can't I just do it my way? And everyone's sort of against him. But we learned that the big bad is actually the bully surprise surprise could have seen that one coming but um linus in the real world who turns out to be named minus in planet drool a plus is the the master mind <laughs> the casting for this bully role and just the whole look of this character i thought was just perfect slime house bully he like he looks kind of like Ben Shapiro. He has a very snivelly <laughs> face, and like, like, and then he he wears uh, one thing I noticed. He wears like a sweatband on each wrist, which I feel like oh, is nice. a very like yep. early two thousand style. I definitely was a big fan of the sweatband. Can't say that I had two, but I did have the sweatband. And at one point, he's wearing a very strange tight, like looks like almost like a bicycling like shirt. That just has a big L on it, which I assume yeah. stands for his name, which I thought was just very funny. Very cartoon come to life where it just like you have a character who wears a letter t-shirt. Also, his hair gel just felt very like 
bad kid, you know, kind of thing going on. Yeah, and he has a lot of very good insults in the film, which of course are always essential to any bully. At one point he says, he's telling a story, like claiming it's about superheroes, but it's talking about Max, the main character, and he says he's half boy, half dork, dork boy. And then to, <laughs> and then another, he calls uh, Shark Boy and Lava Girl at one point, Barf Boy and Vomit Girl. And at one point he just calls Max Dream Boy, which I think it's very funny because it's one of those things that doesn't even sound insulting unless it's delivered in a, a bully tone. But he's like, nah, I'm going to burst your bubble, Dream Boy. Yeah, and Dream Boy <laughs> usually sounds like you're actually lusting after. Yeah. But in, <laughs> <laughs> Before we even get into drool, the one of the slimiest scenes for me is the chase scene in the real world through uh. a playground <laughs> where they're, he's trying to get his dream journal back and... There's an escape through a slide, and then eventually he gets caught on a rope toe and gets his balls knocked by the rope. And just the whole thing feels like a kid would write this choreography for a chase scene. (laughs) Yeah, and they shoot it like it's like an action scene in any other movie, but it clearly is shot on just a very normal sort of elementary school playground, which I think is fun. Yeah, and that's like the slime house to a T. It's like the kid's POV. Everything is heightened. This summer, I met a new friend who was half dork, half boy. I called him Dork Boy. (laughs) But his real name was Max. We had him for dinner, but he stunk so bad that we all blew chunks. I was sound asleep when Shark Boy and Lava Girl woke me up, took me outside, and blasted me away to Planet Dwarf. Max and I had to kick some major evil booty. That's why I couldn't take out the trash last night. Toys from the new movie The Adventures of Shark Boy and Love Girl in 3D are at McDonald's. There's one in every Happy Meal. All right, do we want to move on to maybe some of the, the other tropes in the film, not specific to characters? Well, to the point about the like lack of character development, I think the one I have the biggest gripe with is that the characters of Shark Boy and Lava Girl are so just like... Uh, not even really characters they're just kind of like thing one and thing two that follow max around and that was surprising to me that they didn't have more development that said i think they're both pretty interesting from a slime perspective but despite the fact that they're not developed well i think that's you know splitting hairs in our kind of dissection of this because i think as just pure slime house characters they're fantastic. Shark Boy is might be my favorite <laughs> slime house character we've come across on this show. Yeah, I, from... I, I agree with that. So he's he's <laughs> he's key slime house. Like he represents <laughs> everything about it. He has that attitude that I'll give you. I just meant like they're whatever they're going. They have for. zero development, and I think that like I was totally able to forgive a lot of kind of like the lack of narrative development that I totally recognize does not exist in this movie but that attitude of shark boy and lava girl to me is just so is all you need in this movie really you don't need such like deep character development you just need shark boy to do cool karate tricks and break dance to a song he's making up as he goes you know like to me that's okay. just that's all you okay, need okay fair enough fair enough <laughs> yeah, you know, it's very funny. The The scenes where he's kind of he goes full karate and starts fighting a bunch of uh, plug hounds or, you know, like when he's being attacked by an army of, of uh, 3D enemies. Um, I find that very funny because it's like one of the hardest things to to do for an act, you know, for an actor to pull off is acting or, or especially fighting against things that aren't actually there. And I find it, you know, like so funny to have just a kid just mime out a bunch of karate moves yeah. and they've just like added enemies around him. So he's just, he's just jumping around kicking and, you know, like in chopping and they have like gone in and filled in enemies that he's hitting everywhere. Which I just think like, I want to see that. I just want to see that video of him just on a green screen, just jumping around. Yeah. And I, 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 I got to give a big shout out to Taylor Lautner for this role because I was reading, he, he was an actual martial artist and at this age, he had like won. The way he was actually found is he had won like martial arts competitions, and 
Robert Rodriguez let him choreograph all his fights in this movie. So, so that's all wow. all a lot in there in those fights. Very scenes. cool. <laughs> Not just his fights, but like the slimiest part of this movie for me is when. They're trying to get Max, the main character, not our Max, but Max. To, to, <laughs> they're trying to get Max to go to sleep. And, I, like, Shark Boy has to come up with a song on the spot. And he's, like, just doing dance moves like a Korean pop star. And, like, yeah. it's just he's going for it. And that song is stuck in my head now. Just relax, lay about, or my face will put you out. Dream, 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 dream. Take your time, but be well. It has a hypnotic quality to it. It's like dream, 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 dream. Yes. Uh, it's just... yeah, so something I love about that scene is you can tell they were like, we, we shot this in 3D for a reason. We got to stuff this song with like 3D bits. So set, like multiple times in that song, he'll do stuff just to give an excuse to do some 3D. At one point, one of the lyrics is, want some water, here's a glass. And he just yeah. splashes <laughs> water out. And then at another point, he like does like he says like there's darkness in the air, and he like shoots like twinkles out of his fingers. There's like five, three D gags in just his dream song alone. Yeah, you know, interestingly, the only thing the song doesn't do well is actually put someone to sleep. It's the opposite of a lullaby in that way. <laughs> it's kind of yeah, it's it's an aggressive song, and I mean Shark Boy. Something I didn't remember about this is Shark Boy is very aggressive. Like he's very mean to Max for like the entirety of this movie, and in this song he's threatening him. He says, "Go to sleep, little bleep." At one point, <laughs> yeah, I love that. Yeah. yeah, and he's constant. He's constantly just threatening to like knock Max out with a with pipes and stuff. He's just like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the shark. I wanted to talk about that because for me the biggest Lautner component that's interesting is like the angst that he has. He's so mad all the time and. He has this, I wrote down a couple memorable lines, but the one that I think encapsulates all is he's, at some point he's just like, am I king of the ocean or what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, he may be three-dimensional with his karate moves. His his acting is definitely like one note, kid angst. Well, I, I saw I saw an interview with Taylor Lautner. He said that that was supposed to reflect, this is like an interview from when the movie was made, that that was supposed to reflect that Shark Boy like has a crush on Lava Girl and is sad that Max is getting all this attention, but I didn't really get that feeling mm. at all in the movie. And I mean, in the, the, brow. In, in we could be heroes. The upcoming sequel, they are married and have a child. So I guess Shark Boy and Lava right, Girl. But he's not going to be in it. No, it's a yeah, it's a different actor playing Shark Boy. <laughs> Bummer. Yeah, my favorite Shark Boy line is "Still hungry, Max." How about a knuckle sandwich? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I feel like I, I just love the idea that this like sad kid is using this dream world as an escape his whole life. Then he finally enters it in real life, and one of his dream character just like bullies the shit out of him. It's just like <laughs> as mean to him as as Linus. It's just so weird to me. I mean, th- that's like how he drew him, though. So I, I doubt he takes yeah. it too personally. It's like yeah, I guess it's it's, it's, it's more just yeah, it's attitude more than yeah. anything. <laughs> and we've just touched in on the the food element of this with the knuckle sandwich line but there's a lot of lines about uh what shark boy does and does not like to eat um it's like he's got like it, the movie starts with him as a as racer rodriguez beating sushi to sharks and i just love that but then like he you know as he becomes more of a shark he's eating like fish that's that there's a line about like hey max have this fish it's three weeks old and then yeah there's also like a, something i thought was pretty funny is that like he when they start to go to the the cookie world um there's a lot of like 3d gags of people spitting out food in particular like cookies and chocolate and there's the whole thing about shark boy just i stepped in chocolate and he just like thinks it's gross but like this the old sushi is like a-okay i loved that the chocolate bit was kind of like a substitute for like stepping in poop yeah yeah Um, yeah i thought that was very funny it was a little bit of a stretch but it was very funny but yeah on the 3d gags bit because i watched this on netflix on a on a flat screen without 3d glasses i kind of forgot that it was a 3d movie for a long time until the moment where max eats sugar and spits it out in the screen and then from that moment on i noticed that like over half of the 3d gags that i could visually comprehend without 3d glasses were people spitting stuff out of their mouth like he spits the metal out of his mouth when he chews through the cage in the end or spits water and it's just very funny that like 
projectiles from mouths or what they settled on is an easy 3D punchline. Yeah, I think maybe my favorite food moment is at one point he's the uh, Max is they're in the desert and he says, I'm so hungry I could eat a lava rock and then lava girl's like here take this and gives him something and he eats it and he's like what is this and she's like it's a lava rock and (laughs) and then like smoke just starts shooting out of his ears and this very weird effect i think that's a good slime house trope because we talk about gross food just the idea of eating something that causes smoke to shoot out of your orifices is very slimy (laughs) yep another kind of cartoon come to life like we saw in the grinch where smoke out of the ears is very key and i think we have to if we're gonna do yin and yang we have to talk about lava girl a little bit because she has some intrigue first of all i was reading about this and apparently the original plan wasn't to have taylor cooley's hair be pink but basically someone commented to uh, probably robert rodriguez being like oh yeah hey she she looks just like alexa vega from spy kids and that was like oh no now i like i don't want to have like a like a type like i don't want people to get confused and so i decided to make her hair pink because of that which thing was kind of interesting but the uh, the other thing that always surprises me and i never noticed it in the moment she looks so much older than all of the guys and it, i always forget how girls and guys age at around 12 13 14 and it's so funny to watch i was like wow she so they like cast like a like a 16 year old girl and like a bunch of 11 year old guys so weird and the answer is they're all older than her and that's just how puberty works which like i i always forget i always forget that it's like you know and again you don't notice it when you're when i was 13 i didn't notice like i was just like oh yes all these girls who are my age totally see me as an equal who is also there at the same age as them and then you you then meet 13 and 14 year olds and you're like who are these like tiny children boys and these girls who like basically look like teenagers now and they're you know and are like like a foot and a half taller than them but i i had that moment of like wow like baby taylor lautner and this girl who's like she's gotta be like what 16 like and that was pretty funny yeah i mean she's presented as a very tortured character which i think is interesting as parallel to shark boy he's all attitude and confidence and then lava girl is all depressed trying to find what her meaning is and at one point she says like i'm nothing but a destructive force or something like that she's just a very a very sad character now now that said uh volcanoes have nothing to do with light (laughs) (laughs) yeah 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 no that well yeah i think the funniest thing or the most slimy thing about lava girl is that she has this like function to kind of first of all burn everything like at one point she kisses shark boy on the cheek and he's like ow like you know like she kind of makes things sizzle my favorite lava girl moment was in they're fighting the plug hounds and she in order to escape the the grasp of these plug hounds she turns into literal lava but the way in which it's animated it is very reminiscent of, to me, a very slime house image of the people turning into goo, uh, like a Capri Sun commercial or the secret world of Alex Mack. For some reason, that idea of morphing into a liquid substance and moving around was somehow a thing for kids in the 90s. And then she elements. goes from pure liquid to rock solid ice and for a while she's just this like frozen thing that they like cart around they use her as a sled though which is which is honestly great (laughs) that i like stood up and cheered when that happened that was the best speaking a little more of the 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 humor the jokes in the movie because i feel like this might be one of the less comedic slime house movies we've talked about it's more of an action adventure kind of movie but there are it's a very distinctive sense of humor that I feel like is very specific to kids. It makes sense what we were talking about earlier, how he sort of ran these jokes past his kids. We have a lot of the pun humor. And then there's a decent amount of gross-out, scatological humor in this. I mean, we talked about earlier the bully saying barf boy and vomit girl. And there's also a very slimy battle scene in the end, which maybe we can talk about a little bit. Yes. <laughs> but but the the climax of yeah. that scene, they're casting various brain related attacks and Max says brain fart, which causes Linus's head to grow <laughs> to like blow up really big, which is not the only big head in this movie because of George George Lopez's character. And I yeah, feel like big heads were kind of a thing right 
at this time with the Airheads commercial, the Gushers commercial, a lot of big head humor. So. Sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that dream battle I thought was really funny. It reminded me of Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh, which were both really big at the time. Oh, it reminded me of the end of Dark City. <laughs> Just I haven't little, seen that movie. Oh, all right. It's, it's exactly <laughs> that. It just imagine that, but a serious version of two people just like mind blasting at each other <laughs> from two spires. It's basically exactly Dark City. That's very oh, funny. Except only using brain related puns. <laughs> right, minus the puns. Yeah, there there isn't any pun usage in uh, Dark City. Unfortunately, to its detriment. There's one other kind of odd fart scene in this movie where Mr. Electric is like walking the plug hounds and then he has like a sneeze attack and then he does this really bizarre electric fart and the plug hounds all kind of faint and he's just like, okay, yeah, sorry, that was me. (laughs) It's just like a very strange scene that doesn't really have anything to do with any narrative reasoning but it just you got to throw one of those those can i ask what was the there was something with his daughter in the real world and it was right after they established her as being the love interest within like 10 seconds there's something like oh if you eat that you're gonna be fart like what was the thing that 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 was actually that's a perfect segue (laughs) um she he says she's sick because she's underneath a vent and that Mm -hmm. establishes that she's going to be the ice princess right. later on but she's has a cold and she's blowing her nose and he says like don't do that otherwise you're gonna have more uh, boogers on your homework last, that's what it was your last homework assignment i couldn't even read because there were so many boogers on it. <laughs> <laughs> which again i actually i was gonna say and that just along those lines the just as much as planet drool the classroom scenes feel so slimy to me the whole uh, show and yeah. tell vibe yeah. of like presenting and like the teacher kind of being a dick but also like establishing some order and then stuff like that like boogers on homework that just feels like well all things slime yeah at one point the entire class just pelt smacks with paper balls because like to make fun <laughs> of his essay which feels like a very slime house thing to happen in the classroom <laughs> yeah One of the real stars of the show here is the actual planet drool, where kids rule, (laughs) um, which is the literal slogan that flashes. But man, this is a wacky, wild world. I think you know what you're in for, and you know you're in for some good slime house when they crash land on the planet into ooey green slime. Like, that is how they land on the planet. And so from there, it's all gravy train of slime. It gets even better when they there's a scene where they stop the roller coaster, and Lava Girl like actually uses like lava to stop the roller coaster, and that just especially seemed like a Capri Sun kind of like hour. It's like oh, it's so extreme, and they're on this like thing and they're upside down. Yeah, and yeah, just like all the set <laughs> yeah. pieces, and then yeah, and just like just all the like the world building is very cool, and then they, like they start flying like the, the literal train of thought. That part was was special. Was like okay, ten years down the road, Inside Out might have you know taking some cues from this movie just that whole thing is very interesting and how then they fall into the land of milk and cookies and the stream of consciousness vibe of planet drool was way way cool (laughs) the inside out thing i also noticed jared it's so bizarre they they have a lot of this like subconscious jargon snuck into a kid's movie but the way i was expecting bing bong to show up he does (laughs) yeah the robot tobor 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 is so similar to bing bong (laughs) Yeah, that whole area with like the dream graveyard or whatever they called it very much was the thing that most made me think inside out of the several things in the movie that were reminiscent of it. Because I mean, there's the whole thing with the an inside out that's pretty much that exact idea. Yeah, you know, another thing that I thought about that like really tapped into my like childhood in a weird way that I hadn't expected is all of the 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 plug hounds and all of like the electrical stuff. I don't know if this is true with you guys, but when you're a little kid, like just like power outlets are such a big part of your life in a way you don't think about now. But like, I just remember being so fascinated by like, by like, you know, flipping a switch and trying to run out the door before the light turned on you're like an idiot. Uh, and you know, it's just, it's, it's like funny. It's just like, like it like tapped in the plug hounds and, and like evil electrical things as well. Just kind of like, like all of the, uh, Mr. Electric stuff, like kind of like tapped in a weird way. I didn't expect uh, that kind of like hit for me in a good way. 
yeah, when the movie, like, when the plugs first showed up in the first scene that they're in, I was like, why are the monsters in this movie plugs and wires? Like, why are they electric, like, electrical outlets? And, yeah, I feel like that is something that an eight-year-old is compelled by, so it makes sense that that would be sort of the main, a main image that shows up in this movie. I interpreted it as... When you, in the real world, you see his like alarm clock and other thing, and his like lights plugged into this thing. So I kind of read it as, oh, the plugs are what allow him to wake up because that's what powers his mm. alarm clock. Um, it allows oh, him to wake up, and that they also go through that world of and, clocks at one point where a big cuckoo clock is like attack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah, the yeah. passage of time. It, it felt like more than forty-five minutes, but maybe they're playing by Inception rules. i will say my favorite device in this movie while we're on the subject of timers was shark boy's shark timer they just have a couple quick shots of it but just the way it looks is looks exactly like something i would have seen in like toys r us in like 2001 his shark watch a signature robert rodriguez slime element is kind of inanimate objects becoming henchmen as we know from thumb thumbs and <laughs> the plug hounds mm. so yeah you know it's fascinating that this kid built this this robot that is so production designed it's the coolest looking robot ever and like i, I that, like when it showed up i was like wow that is like the cool it's such a that's such, like such a designed robot and it's like ah yes the the old thing i couldn't get to work and so you could sell that as just a like a cool sculpture people would, would just buy that that's slime house to a t though that wishful moment of like do it yourself and make this thing that is amazingly designed and and his room is really cool and and then there's that like hand drawn element of it especially in the non dream world that kind of feel like what kids would conjure yeah just the idea i feel like that he's coming up with all these ideas in his dream journal even if they're not becoming gadgets or inventions does speak very much to that diy ethos that shows up in these movies Definitely. And speaks to kind of the Robert Rodriguez kind of ethos as well. You know, a lot of his movies, be it his kids movies or his more adult movies are very DIY, you know, shoestring budget, make it on the seat of your pants. So I I think it's very fitting. Maybe, maybe back in the day, Robert Rodriguez himself was, was a character in a Slimehouse movie. Could have been. His sure. kids mm-hmm. definitely lived that life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't want to like linger too much on this, but the CGI in this movie is very yeah. dated in, in today's day and age. I don't think that's necessarily something we need to like go into besides the fact that, you know, it, it, it does make the film look much, much more slimy and of its era. But I think what, what makes it to me so slimy is how bold and colorful this whole world is and saturated and, and, you know, this harsh kind of lighting that's in this movie. We saw this in the Grinch. We see this in a lot of these more fantastical slime movies where the look is just so exaggerated and, and, and cartoony and colorful that it feels like a kid's storybook or a theme park. Or in this case, you know, with the CGI, it, to me, it reminded me very much of like a video game of the time. To me, just just how the palette of this movie is very and slime. interestingly, I reread the Roger Ebert review, and he mostly critiqued the fact that the three D really dimmed all that and made it look really kind of ghastly dark. Which I remember about Spy Kids three D being that way, and we'll talk yeah, about definitely. that when that episode comes on. But I think in some sense, the movie might have gotten better praise if they omitted the three D because of that reason, Jasper. I, I noticed the same thing. But I could also see how with especially the shitty 3D method that they used in a pre-Avatar world, it was very, like, you could see how it would muddle all those colors. Yeah, because it was was still the era of the red and blue glasses. It wasn't even real D yet. So the whole movie just had this tint to it. I actually do remember that from when I saw it in theaters. I think something else important to talk about with sort of the look of this movie is, yes, the CGI is very dated, but... It also, I feel like, was not even necessarily looking like great effects for the time. So it feels (laughs) like it was very much focused on making a distinctive world, not making like a breathtaking looking movie in a way. Because like 
other movies that came out that year were like there was Chronicles of Narnia, even something in like like Sky High, which is a more Slimehouse movie, looked much different than this. The effects were better on probably a comparable budget, and so it feels like this weird, very slick sort of CGI video game world is sort of something Robert Rodriguez was going for not that like it wasn't also dated because it is but it does feel like he was going for this very cartoon world regardless of budget or like the time period that it was made well it was the era of playstation 2 and it looks like it so (laughs) (laughs) yeah it almost reminds me of kind of like early virtual reality in a weird way which i think is also kind of fitting of the story yeah, I feel like it kind of reminds me of the movie Lawnmower Man. If you've ever seen, that. like that's oh, what the no. effect, that's what the effect. It's better than Lawnmower Man. Let's, <laughs> well, let's yeah, give it some credit. Lawn- Lawnmower Man is is like uh, PlayStation. It's not even PlayStation One. That's pre. That's, that's oh, pre. Yeah. Um, no, I think it's also like uh, you know, there's there's just there's some that's by choice, and I think there's some just by the virtue of what they're trying to do. It's like you know, Narnia. You're creating a. You're creating a lion. You're cre- you know doing set extensions and you know armies. But you, but this is like we're just sh- this is a movie where we're just shooting things everything on a green screen. Like this is every everything is fake. And in the yeah. the answer is like I mean I think that even now movies that do that it's pretty hard to make those look real. You know and so it's like you know it's I don't think there I think other movies that that tried to bite off that much from a visual effects standpoint of this time you know similarly probably didn't look particularly good but it but also this is for kids and you know so they're not gonna they're not going for the same thing yeah i feel like it's just not really aiming for a realistic world at all and i think that's good like i i I don't think it looks good but i do think it's unique and i like it and with that totally i think it's time for some slime scores so on a scale one to ten how are we feeling Sam, do you want to kick us off as our guest? Uh, yeah, so I, I, can I ask how the slime score works? This is how slimy I think it is. Yeah, it's just how slimy it is. Mm-hmm. A one is no slime. Like, it has no slime house elements whatsoever. So okay, like, so once upon a time in Mexico is a one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then a ten <laughs> is like yeah. all things slime house. Like, just whatever that means to you. But just like to you, it's like the max level pun intended i guess but the max level that you can make a slime house movie okay i'm gonna have a i think this will be controversial after we just talked about all the slimy things i still think i'm gonna give it a six and my reason is i still think it is it has the trappings of a slime movie but it the spirit of it in a weird way, is almost like more pure than the slime movies. Like this, you know. I think if if normally slime movies are, we're trying to we're adults trying to get at what will appeal to kids. This is almost like this is the real thing they're trying to get toward, and thus almost isn't a slime movie. That is the most bizarre take. That Especially because earlier you were the one who was like kind of bringing us back down and reminding us that this is not you know highbrow. So. No, that. well, no, but that's yeah. I, I still think though that in a weird way, it's it it's a little bit. It's it's like the real thing, and slime movies are like trying to get it. They they yeah. mean well. There's in Slimehouse. There's this mean kind of crude spirit, but in this, the moral of the story is a very earnest, meaningful thing to yeah. Robert Rodriguez. And it's okay. And, and, okay. Yeah, and like and, and like the, again, the thing I'm like trying to say, and I can't explain it well because I'm doing a bad job, is like Slimehouse movies are about trying to to market this thing to kids it's like it's this thing that we're selling to kids and we're trying to get toward this thing in a weird way the getting toward is the slime house and this is actually just that thing this is just an eight-year-old's brain you know like kind of i don't know there's there's like a purity to it that that i i walked I, i remember finishing it and thinking you know it's not the slimiest thing i've seen purely in like it's the spirit of it, even if the trappings are very slimy. So six is where I'm, I'm going to stake my flag. I'll counter that. I think this is a perfect 10. The entire time watching this, I was smiling so big. I was having such a fun time. And to keep it short, I, I think it's just that slime house attitude of this movie that really sets it to that highest level for me. It, it feels so of its era and its look and its feel. The jokes are just so aimed at kids. And I think just 
the simple fact that it is written by an eight-year-old about what goes on in a kid's mind is, to me, the essence of what Slimehouse is. And so that, it's a perfect 10 for me. Yeah, I'm going to jump right in and say this is a flat 10 for me as well. I think Robert Rodriguez is one of the few directors who is very deliberately making this energy of movie. And like I said, it's not it's not a traditional like check off the tropes that are happening. It's it's much more a tourist than any of that. And I think in that sense it kind of transcends a lot of my usual check boxes for slime. I was not smiling during this movie like Jasper, but I still think it is everything a slime house movie could aspire to and then some. It's almost like the the high cinema equivalent of slime house. Yeah, I gotta say, I think this is a 10 for me as well. I think it was one that I kind of thought about for a while because it is so a uh, tear driven. It's such a, or it's a, like, it's a slime house movie, but it's all sort of how, like, somebody like Argento, he makes horror movies, but they're also Argento movies. This is a slime house movie, but it's also sort of above all else a Rodriguez movie, which can mi- kind of make you think maybe this isn't a perfect slime, but I mean, I think it's just, we've never really dealt with someone who sort of, I mean, Robert Rodriguez, I assume, doesn't know what Slimehouse is, but he is setting out to make Slimehouse movies. I don't know if we can say the same about anyone else, and I think that's what makes this a perfect 10. It's sort of the purest form of slime. And you know what? I am somewhere in between the two groups here. The fact that this is actually kind of like a thought experiment of a movie where it's about a seven-year-old child and it's written by a seven-year-old child i think that just gives that the beating heart of this movie however i do think that some of the visual elements we talked about are just they're kind of novelty and they're novelty in a way that i just don't think is very slime house like 3d for instance i think the, the gimmick of that is something extraneous to slime house i don't think it's like it doesn't really embody like the the ideal slime house movie in my opinion because of some of that extra sugar, if you will. Um, so I would actually go for an eight. Ah. A perfect 10 movie has yet to cross our path, and I am totally cool with that. It's an elusive beast. <laughs> the last thing I will say about this movie, at one point I kind of stepped out and came back, and it reminded me of going to see Cats with Jasper and Jared. I, I left to go to the bathroom and came back and said to Jared, I said, like, what did I miss? And there was like a, there was like a long silence and Jared was just like, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I remember this. Cat, c- Cats is a movie of solely introductions. It's a movie of solely <laughs> characters introducing themselves. That's and, it. Uh, like, yeah. Cats, I, Cats is a remarkable movie. I like, I don't know about you guys, but I, it, it yeah it like like unravels everything you know like i walked out disoriented as to like how like to even like walk normally or <laughs> or like talk normally like it man that yeah that that's was really, experience like, i felt kind of in that essence of this movie where it's like i don't know what to do with this and i don't know and it's easy to dismiss it as like one of the worst movies ever made which it on imdb is and yet and yet that's almost too simple of a thing to say <laughs> Well, that wraps up our discussion on the first episode of season two of Slimehouse. And we're looking forward to more fun, some winter slime coming your way. And until then, stay slimy. Peace out. Dream. Slimehouse, a podcast created by Jared Anderson, Jasper Birnbaum, Max Morris, and H. Nelson Tracy. If you like this episode, you can find more fun on slimehousepod.com. Our website is created by Brian Hume of Valencia Creative Company. Our theme music composed by Greta Russell. Support this podcast at anchor.fm slash slimehousepod or by following us on social media at slimehousepod on all platforms.